Hey gang, today we're going to look at habit formation um, and specifically how it relates to our apps. Now, you've been trying out a handful of different habit formation type apps moving up until this point in this class. So that could be things like tracking your calories or tracking your spending or tracking how many books you've read or um, tracking your step count and all that sort of thing. And these tools are incredibly useful and powerful. The problem is, is it what probably most of you ran into is that they're incredibly hard to start doing. And the reason to, and to sustain, the reason is simple. The value comes after sustained use. The value does not come up the upfront. And so if it takes you six weeks to start seeing the value of some app that you're using, um, you're more likely than not within the first six weeks to stop using it, and then it's no longer valuable. <clears throat> and this actually aligns not just with your experience with the tracking stuff, but it actually aligns with research. So there's some really, really interesting research about habit formation. It's found that over 40% of our lives are on autopilot. And so what that means is that 40% of the time we're just doing things out of habit. We're not doing things out of being intentional. And I'm sure this is true for many of you. I, um, when I was in high school, there were multiple times I would get in the car with the intent of going to go do some high school thing, like going to the mall or um, a basketball game or whatever, and I would get in my car and I would just start driving, and before I knew it, I would just end up at my school parking lot or on the way to school because I was just so used to when I get in the car, I drive to school because that's the primary thing that I use the car for. And so when I deviated from that, um, I would just kind of snap out of it, like kind of lock into this trance and then snap out of it and realize that um, I was just habitually going to do something. And that is inside of this 40%. You don't think about how you brush your teeth. You don't think about um, how you turn on the television or what Netflix show you're going to watch. You don't think about, um, you likely don't think about like how you're going to get started to study. You probably have one specific place and you go and you take your laptop out of the bag and you get all your stuff and you plug things in and blah, 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 blah. You're not actively thinking about any of that. It's all routines and um, built-in stuff that's just kind of been encoded into your brain. When you walk, you're not thinking about walking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why you, can, that's why you see people all over campus wearing headphones because they can get away with not really paying attention to what's going on around them because they're just kind of in a system locked into going down this path to this class, etc. Now there's been a lot of research around habit formation over the last handful of decades and there's been a lot of popular um, popular texts that people read, you know, these are the types of books that you might find when you're about to get on an airplane trip in the little in the bookstore at the airport that the guys in suits pick up and that sort of thing. But two of them, I've read, I've read a lot of these books and two of them in particular are kind of well respected in this space. One is The Power of Habit by Duig and Atomic Habits by Clear. Power of Habit came first and Atomic Habits came second. What's interesting about The Power of Habits is it's not just a book about how you can change your habits, but also you can apply these kind of habit formation principles to marketing and interaction design and that sort of thing. But I want to look at what these two argue, and then we're going to break it down and apply it to what we're going to be doing next, which is applying it to how do we use technology to help people be more healthy. So let's look at these two basic print, these two basic books, how they break down what they call the habit cycle. The habit cycle is, look, habit, by, by the word habit, we mean many things. We mean you doing something, we mean something causing you to do it, we mean a result of you doing it, etc., etc., etc. And these two books kind of break it down like this. So Duig says, first there's a cue. Next, there's a routine, which is the action that you take. Next is a benefit that you experience that we call a reward. So the cue can be all kinds of things. A cue can be things like when I enter this specific location at this time of date, when I have this emotional state, when I see these people, whatever the immediately preceding action was, that sort of thing. So let's take my example of driving to school. For me, when I was in high school, it was a time thing. I'm sure that you guys did the same thing. School started at some ungodly hour in middle school and high school, and so you're half asleep. And so when I'm in the half asleep stage, I just habitually get into my car and start driving to um, the high school when I'm in high school. Okay? Or um, brushing your teeth might be another habit that you have. And you have the emotional state of being sleepy, or just right after that, you just woke up, or you're standing in your bathroom in the morning. Those are all cues that tell you to do a specific action, the routine. 
And then that routine is rewarded in some way, some benefit that you experience. So, for instance, Duick talks about um, toothpaste. Tooth, toothpaste and toothbrushing wasn't incredibly popular until one thing was added, and that is a chemical to toothpaste that makes your mouth feel cleaner, a little minty chemical. Now, your teeth are not actually cleaner because of this chemical. It just makes it feel nice inside your mouth. And so people form habits not just because it's good to brush your teeth, but because it feels good. That's the reward, the benefit you experience. I'm sure that none of you have ever skipped brushing your teeth ever in your entire life, but if you had, then you know half the day you're walking around feeling like you have fuzzy teeth because you didn't brush and you're used to always having that clean mouth feel. And so the reward of clean mouthfeel is enough to reinforce the cue and the routine, so much so that it's just automatic now. You know, I have kids, and when my kids are little, I had to constantly say, hey, it's morning, we brush our teeth in the morning. Hey, it's morning, we brush our teeth in the morning. There's no way you're telling yourself that in the morning. You know this is what I brush because you have all these cues, which triggers a routine, and the reward is it feels nice. Now, clear um, took Duig's ideas and kind of expanded a little bit. So he took the cue and the reward, and the, or he took the cue and the reward, and added something, and that is a craving. The cue causes us to want something, and then that want triggers a specific response, and then that response triggers a reward, and it continues the cycle. Now I'm not sure which is better way of thinking about it, two higs or clears, but we're just going to dig into clears today. And clear makes the the argument that if you want to change existing habits, if you want to break old habits, you can't do it. You can't change the cue and the craving. Duig argues, or Clear argues rather, that the cue and the craving are like big stones that are just dropped. They cannot be moved. So instead, the way that we cho choose old habits is not change the cue or the craving. You can't change the fact that when you're, if you're trying to stop smoking, for instance, you can't change the fact that at certain times of day um, you have a craving which is triggered by the cue of um, a nicotine need. You can't change that uh, cue and craving in order to trigger the response. It's just too innate. Same thing with me. I'm totally addicted to coffee. I make, I have no problem with that. If I have to be addicted to something, it's a great vice to have. So I'm 100% addicted to coffee and specifically to caffeine and coffee. Um, I can't change the fact that in the morning, every single morning, I walk over to my coffee machine, put the little thing in the thing, and press the go button, and it smells nice, and I have this craving, and a warm liquid, and all of that, and I consume coffee. I can't change the cue and the craving. But what I can change, Claire argues, is the response can be swapped out with a different response. So the cue stays the same, the craving stays the same. The only thing different is what you do with it. So for instance, for coffee for me, Clear would say, if you're trying to reduce your caffeine intake, and let's say you brew two cups of coffee every morning, the cue and the craving can't change, but what you can do is where you keep the coffee, well, I have a Keurig, so where I keep my coffee pods, my default state for coffee pods, I might replace normal coffee pods with decaf coffee pods. And so my response is still the same. I get up in the morning, I walk over to the Keurig, I open a little jar that holds the the coffee pods, I put the little pod into the machine and I hit go, I consume and get the same reward and it feels nice because of warm liquid. I get all of that still, only I've swapped out the response, specifically um, brewing caffeinated coffee with brewing decaffeinated coffee for my first cup. And now you might say, hey Artie, um, you know, if you just cut caffeine cold turkey, you'll get headaches and you'll feel awful and all that kind of stuff. And Clear would say, that's fine. Because when you're in the automatic mode, when you're half awake, the first cup is just going to be the decaf. And you might say, hey, for the second cup, I'll remember, oh, yeah, this is decaf. And I'll walk over to the closet and make it difficult to get to the, the bad stuff for me. And I'll brew my second cup caffeinated. And so there, I have a completely limited caffeine. I've just reduced it in half. And Clear argues that eventually, as you swap out these responses with different, more positive responses, the reward cycle will start to change as well. And so then the whole cycle can start up, updating and getting better and better and better and better. So for instance, let's say you have a bad habit of going to sleep on time, not going to sleep on time. You can't change the, the cue and the craving. You want to go have fun at night or you want to go watch this TV show or what have you. What you could do is just simply say, you know what, I'm going to start watching the TV show I like an hour earlier. 
Um, and so you still are watching that TV show, but now your response is you're going to bed an hour earlier. Or maybe an hour is too big. Maybe it's just 15 minutes. And you move yourself 15 minutes earlier um, for a week, and then you're an hour earlier. Or five minutes, or one minute, or whatever. But over time, you're slowly changing the cue, your response to the cue and the craving in order to get something different. Okay, that's great. That's how we change old habits. But if I'm somebody that's launching a new app and I want you to start using my app on a regular basis because engaged users, users are using it every day, they are the most valuable users in the world. So how do I possibly do that? How do I create brand new habits? Well, Clear also talks about this in Atomic Habits and that's what we're gonna look at next is how do I create brand new habits? And Duig says you gotta start with the cue. You gotta start with the cue. You can't start with the response, you can't start with the reward, you gotta start with the cue. And, do, and Clear argues that cues have to be these four, one of these or multiple of these four things. They must be obvious, they must be attractive, they must be easy, and they must be satisfying. And by that he means it's really obvious that this is a cue that's supposed to be triggering some act activity in you. Basically, hey, remember you said you're gonna do this? Attractive, it must be something you kinda wanna do it must be easy to do because our lives are all so full and it must be satisfying. And after you're done, you're like, oh, that felt nice. It doesn't need to be huge. It doesn't need to be like satisfying like at the end of a Thanksgiving meal. It could just be as simple as, oh, I feel a slightly better about myself because of that. Now let's think about that. The second I say cue or reminder, that kind of thing, in the mobile world, you're all thinking about this. You're all thinking about notifications. In fact, probably most of the apps that you downloaded and tried out have some kind of navig notification system. But if you're like me, the queue for notifications is garbage. So some kind of image pops up on screen or there's a little ding of a notification. And my craving is not to go check out what that thing is that dinged. My craving is to get it out of my life, to get that notification out of my life. So my, my craving is triggers a response, which is to completely ignore or clear out that notification without ever, ever doing anything about it. Because to me, the reward is a nice clean home screen on my phone, not one populated with a bunch of stuff I'm supposed to do. So while notifications came, like kind of came into this world as the answer to this problem, they just kind of suck. And so we want to avoid notifications as much as possible as our cue. So if we're trying to make cues obvious, attractive, easy and satisfying, notifications isn't really the way to go. So let's kind of unpack each one of those four and what that might look like for a health-related app. Okay, so if we're trying to make a cue that is obvious, there could be a couple of different things. One of the things I do is that I listen to podcasts a lot and my reaction, my cue for, my response is driven by a cue, which is boredom. And so I take out my phone and I have on the first home screen in the upper left-hand corner my podcasting app of choice. And that's how it's been for years. And so I'm bored. I have a craving to not be bored. My response is take out my phone and tap the icon in the upper right-hand side of the screen in order to trigger a podcast. And ah, I get the sweet, sweet reward of no boredom. Okay? Now, something that I have done in my own life is that there's some app that I want to start using either instead of podcasts or just remember that I want to do it, maybe it's audiobook reading app or something like that, I'll actually move the icon for my podcasting app someplace else in my phone. In that upper right corner of the home screen, I'll put in the new app that I want to start doing. I'll make it obvious, so it's almost like muscle memory for me to do it. Other obvious things could be you know, notifications that fire at random times aren't very useful, but notifications that, tie, that, that fire at certain locations or when you're near certain individuals or when the system might know that you're not busy by looking at your calendar, those kind of notifications are useful. You know, if you send me a notification while I'm in the middle of class, I'm going to ignore it. You send me a notification while I'm walking boredly from one side of campus to the other side of campus, I'm, I'm probably more likely to pay attention to that notification. Let's talk about making apps and habit formation attractive. Um, so not only should our apps look nice, but users should, make, should be able to feel like they own them, that it kind of feels like theirs. So customized themes, making the app fun to use, lots of little wiggles and giggles and, and nice sounds and that sort of thing, and, and animation can really make the app more attractive and make me want to get in there and mess around some more. An app should be easy to use. Um, it should have things like 
you know, uh, widgets on the home screen that you can swipe over to, or things like this, smart notifications like this app is using, where it shows you something you're supposed to do, but then right within that notification, you can take action. So you don't have to go into the app. You can hit, you know, postpone or route or whatever. And so by making something easy, you're trying to, um, you, you just remove friction. Other ways that you can make things easy is tied to existing actions. So for instance, um, I have an app that is one that's helping me to remember certain habits and trying to form that I'll talk about later. Um, but this app ties in the health kit. So if one of my habits I'm trying to work, uh, I'm trying to build is work out X number of days a week for Y number of minutes, this app ties in the health kit. So my workout app is saving all of my health data, all my workout data to health kit, and then this. Um, tracking app is reading the health data and will just automatically check off certain tasks I'm trying to track for me, making it totally easy. Or other kinds of things you can do is have apps that trigger certain activity based on certain movement or preceding activity. So you could have an app that integrates with HealthKit and says, you know, the Apple Watch does this. It, it ties in the HealthKit and other things and notices it looks like you're about to go running or you are running and it pops up a notification and says, hey, do you want to track this? It looks like you're running. Um, those kinds of things are notifications, but they're easy because they're integrated into what you're already doing and they're being triggered by preceding actions. Another way to make things easy is to make the task incredibly small. You know, I'm a grown up, and so that means I have to pay taxes. And due taxes is a giant task. So it for me requires multiple days, lots of paperwork, real pain in the butt. But if I, so what I do is I break that into very minute, small, Tasks. And I literally had a task last week on my task management app, which was start taxes, not do taxes, start taxes. And what did I do? I just emailed my accountant and said, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to be your, your client this year. What do you need from me? And just that very small action was easy to do. And so I'm able to kind of trigger that thing. And so when I got the cue of a notification from my to-do app saying, hey, you said you wanted to start your taxes today. It was very easy for me to engage in the response of send an email because I instantly felt the reward of, oh, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Whew, that feels nice. Next, a cue needs to be satisfying, um, especially new ones. So how can we make it more satisfying? This is an app that I said I would mention later that I use called Streaks. And what Streaks lets you do is allows you to track up to 12 different habits you're trying to form. And you can check them off each day. You can see here it's also tied into HealthKit. So in the top left corner, the red one, you can see walk 11,000 steps is tied into HealthKit and it's been turned white because it's been completed by this person. Well, that's just automatic. My phone is constantly tracking my steps. The second that it hits 11,000 steps, it pops up a notification on my phone saying, hey, good job, you hit your goal for today. You can see that on the red one on the right hand, top right hand side, this person has not quite run their 0.2 miles yet. They're almost there. Then, or you can manually track, so you can see don't eat bad food down there. This person has checked that off manually, they've gone in and checked it. But what's cool about streaks is that it keeps track of the total number of times you've done this in a row. So you can see inside the walk 11,000 steps, inside that circle there's a number three. That just means that this has been accomplished three times in an unbroken chain. The run 0.2 miles is 12 times, and the star means this is the total, this is the highest number of streaks that they've ever accomplished. This is incredibly satisfying. This app, when I check it off, it has a nice little animation. It makes a satisfying little bing sound effect. It does a satisfying little jiggle using the, the uh, accelerometer inside the phone to make it shake. It, it just makes me feel good. It's also satisfying because it feels good to see that number of total number of streaks go up by one. You probably all know people that use things like Snapchat and streaks where they're keeping conversations going with people they really don't care about, but they're keeping them going because who wants to break a streak after a certain amount of time? So that's habits. Let's think about what that can mean for our apps. We want to create health apps, and health apps by their very nature have to be used over an extended period of time before they're beneficial to users. You don't just suddenly get in shape in the next day. You don't get your finances together in 24 hours. You can't possibly form healthy long-term relations with the people in an afternoon. All these kinds of things that we consider health, you can't pull off instantaneously. They're all things that require continuous engagement over a long period of time, and each engagement is just improving things by some infinitesimal amount that you can barely see. But by continuing to engage in that thing over the long period, people's lives get better. And so what we're going to be looking at 
in this next project is how do you design something that does have a habit formation component to it? Because really, when you think about it, if I'm going to start tracking my workouts using an app, and I've never worked out before, there's two habits I'm trying to form. There's the habit of working out, but there's also the habit of remembering to launch the app to log my workouts. And so how do we make it easier for users to engage in these types of habits? And when we think about it, when you think about cues, we need to think about cravings, when you think about responses, and when you think about rewards and tying those things all in together. That also dovetails into our next topic that we'll look at later, which is how do we gamify this so that reward really is outsized? You know, the reward of working out takes months and months and months. They say it takes six weeks before you even notice yourself looking any better after doing workouts for six weeks straight, and 12 weeks before anybody else would even notice. That's a long time. So how do we make it so that that reward is compressed, so that instead of make, waiting six weeks before you get any kind of reward from working out, you start getting rewards in a smaller time frame. And the same is true in all the other aspects of health that we're going to look at, be it financial or intellectual or any of that sort of thing. All of those things take a long time before you see the rewards of the activity. And so how do we make those rewards um, outsized compared to what they actually are? That's what we'll look at next. Um, and I'll see you then.